Namine Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patita Nam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasari Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So we welcome everyone to our study of Srimad Bhagavatam and we are on Canto 6, chapter number 14 today. We are beginning the unit concerned with Chitraketu. Everyone can hear me okay? Yeah? No problems? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, as we can hear you. Okay, good. Uh, so people will be coming, I guess. So that, uh, let's see, now, in the previous section we were talking, we were hearing about Vrita, Vritasura and we heard how Vritasura was killed with the help of the weapon which was given by the Dadichi's bones on the advice of Lord Vishnu. So after Indra had killed Vritasura, Vritasura suffered, and we heard how he suffered for something like a thousand years. He had to suffer uh, for the sinful reactions. And then later on, then he was able to go back and take his position as king of heaven. But he was appreciating that Vritasura was really a great devotee. So this point was picked up by Maharaj Parikshit, who was hearing about Vritasura from Sukadeva Goswami. So Maharaj Parikshit begins this new chapter. He's asking Sukadeva Goswami, how, how did it happen that this Vritasura could be such a great devotee? because he was such a demon at the same time, that although he was a devotee, he was such a demon. And he was giving a lot of trouble to different people. Well, he was fighting with Indra, he was fighting against the demigods. He gave a lot of trouble. He was, he was not in the mode of goodness, was he? So, that's the first section of this chapter anyway. We'll, we'll go through the chapter, but let's have a look at the breakdown of the chapter. We're given three, three sections. The first seven verses are dealing with Maharaj Pariksha's inquiry. And then the second section, you have Sukadeva Goswami introducing the topic of Chitraketu, and he's telling about the story which he had heard from great sages. Oh, rather, Sukadeva Goswami is telling about the Maharaj Chitraketu and how Maharaj Chitraketu was in a difficult situation because he had no son, and then he got visited by a great sage called Angira. 
and we'll hear about Angira, how he comes and meets Maharaj Chitraketu, and then they talk. And then the last section of the chapter describes about the birth of the son with the help of Angira that Chitraketu was able to get the son. And then we'll hear about the problems that also brought for Chitraketu. Okay, so connection with the previous chapter is very clear because we heard the previous chapter, we were hearing about Vritasura and how he really was a, a good devotee and even Indra was appreciating him. That this Vritasura was a better devotee than Indra. Indra, he just wanted to be king of heaven. But Vritasura, he wanted to go back to Godhead. His desire was that he could go back to Godhead. And certainly it seems that he achieved that. That's the account, the information we're given from the Bhagavatam, that he went back to Godhead. So how did he become such a great devotee? This is certainly bewildering to the mind of Maharaj Pariksha. Now some people think some people think that to become a pure devotee, you have to be born in a brahmana family. You should be a brahmana before you can go back to Godhead. There's that misconception that the, if you're born in the brahmana family, that will be your last birth. And then next life you go back to Godhead. But we know that's not really the, the way it is. Not all brahmanas are devotees. And brahmanas often they just simply want to go to the higher planets, like Indra. So Maharaj Parikshit wants to understand this situation Because he knows pu pure devotees are very rare. How rare? Amongst millions of liberated souls? Well, first of all, amongst many people, millions of people, you get hardly one who is a liberated soul. And if you have many liberated souls, then Hardly one of them will be a pure devotee. So Maharaj Parikshit wants to understand how is it possible Vridasura could be a good devotee, such a great devotee. So we have to understand where do you get bhakti from? That's a problem, right? Where does bhakti come from? Who can answer? Any devotees? Samara. Yes. Through the association. Through the association of what? Of devotees. Of devotees. So you get bhakti through the association of devotees. Yes, of course, Chitraketu was uh, like because of the association and getting instruction from Narada Muni and Angira Muni, he received uh, bhakti. Okay, do you know any verse from the scripture which says you get Bhakti from devotees? No, that verse simply says, in the association of devotees you'll take pleasure in hearing topics of Lord Krishna. Huh? 
Huh? Yes, go ahead. Tulayama Lavena P. You know the verse? I don't remember exactly. You really? You just learned it. <laughs> From the first canto, right? Yes. Tulayana Lavena P. Somebody can help her? Who knows this? Oh, very good. Do you know the translation? A devotee's association uh, with the Levena, one um, as a moment of association with the uh, devotee uh, that will is, uh, give us uh, snap, uh, that is better than the uh, Sorga getting uh, heavenly planets or any other um, sense uh, uh, gratification. Yes, of the value of a moment's association with devotees is greater than heavenly, going to the heavenly planets, or material <coughs> opulence, which is only meant for those who are meant for death, right? The sense, the ingen, sense enjoyment of material opulence is, those, is, meant for, is for those who are meant for death. But the value of a moment's association is greater than heavenly planets, or even liberation, what to speak of material opulence, which is for those who are meant for death. R right? Who spoke the verse? Who spoke that verse? Who? No, wait, hey, just a minute, wait. Who spoke that verse? Tulayana Lavenapi, who's speaking? Hare Krishna Prabhu, um, um, I spoke that uh, uh, sloka. Who? Um, uh, uh, Siddhala Matai Madhari started it. No, um, but I, who spoke it in the Bhagavatam? Oh, sorry. <laughs> that is... Uh, uh, Hare Krishna. In the mission, uh, Shonkadeshi asked to Sudhgosam. Yeah, the sages of Naimisharanya were speaking. Addressing Sutta Goswami, right? Right. There's a. Is there any? There's another verse also. Just like, huh? Naisha matista vaduru sparshati anartha pagomo yatartha mahi asham padra rajo pichikram nishkin chananam navrini tayavat. Yes. Very Prahlad good. Prahlad Maharaj, right? Yes, Guru Maharaj. What happened? How did Prahlad speak that verse? What was he asked? Uh, when, uh, before this, uh, Guru Maharaj, he said that Matirna Krishna Parato Sato, uh, that people who, who yeah, are attached to material life, they Why, why did he say uh, that? What, did, what happened? Why did he say these things? His father asked him what he's learnt in school. Yes. His father asked him who taught him because he wanted to know, right? But remember, Haranyakashipu was accusing the teachers, Sunda and Amarka, the sons of Sukracharya. He accused them that you've been teaching my boy these things. And they said, no, no, we didn't teach him. Right? Sunda yes. Namarka, they said, no, we didn't teach him these things. We, would, we didn't teach him about Vishnu. We didn't teach him about devotion to Vishnu. So then Harani Kashipu wants to know, then where did he get it from? Right? So then he asked Prahlad, where did you get it from? 
So then Prahlad speaks Materna Krishna Paratasvatova Vibo Vipadeta Griha Vratanam Madanta Gobir Vishatam Tamishram Punas Punacharvita. That you don't get it by your own endeavor, you don't get it just by others. And and then he speaks the other verse, uh, Natevid Natevidu Natevidu Swarkati Gatim Hi Vishnu Durasha Yegati Artamanina. That the blind if you follow blind people you will never get any good result. You have to get the dust, you have to get the mercy of the devotees. And those devotees have to be niskinchana. They have to be without material attachments. They have to be freed of all contamination. When you get that kind of association, then you can actually get bhakti, right? So Jiva Goswami, he cites these two verses, this one from the first canto, Tulayana Lavinapi, and then also Prahlad Maharaj, Naisham Matistava Danuk and Urukramangrim. These two verses are cited by Jiva Goswami as evidence that where you get bhakti from? Bhakti has to come from a devotee, from somebody who's got bhakti. You cannot, you don't get it just by being in the mode of goodness. You, bhakti is independent of the material nature. Doesn't depend on being in the mode of goodness. Of course it's easier, you could say it's easier if you're in the mode of goodness, but it's not dependent on it. Right? Can you think of some other people that were not in the mode of I, goodness? No, I, yes? Even uh, one more uh, uh, prasanga like uh, Krishna to Uddhava. Krishna to Uddhava. Yeah, satsanga labdhaya bhaktya mahi maam sa upasita savai me darshitam sadvir anjasa vintrate padam. Translation. One who has obtained a pure devotional service by association with my devotees always engages in worshipping me. Thus, he very easily goes to my abode, which is revealed in revealed by my pure devotees. Okay, that's not the verse quoted by Jiva Goswami. Jiva Goswami quoted the two verses I just told you. He only quoted two verses. There's, there's others, there are others, I know, but the, the two verses he quoted, he thought they're very significant, indicating where we get bhakti. We get it from the devotee. You've got to get the devotee, you've got to get it from the devotee, and you've got to take the mercy from the devotee. You don't get bhakti any other way. So it's an important point. Because Vritasura was not in the mode of goodness, right? He was definitely not in the mode of goodness. He had this demon body and he was giving trouble to a lot of people. But he did have great devotion and this was recognized by Indra. Now Indra is also a devotee, but he was appreciating this Vritasura. That, wow, this Vrita Sura, he's really got devotion. So he was very, Maharaj Parikshit, hearing about it, he's very surprised because he knows that pure devotees are very rare. So, how does he know Vrita Sura is a pure devotee? Anybody? Scared to leave his body, he wanted to go back to the sanctuary of the lotus 
to the Lord. So he was increasing in that people, people are wasting his time. He was what? He was, uh, he was uh, encouraging Indra to kill him all, so that he can go and serve the Lord immediately. Yes. He was not attached to the body. He, wasn't, he didn't have any attachment to the material body. Even when Indra cut one, one arm off, he didn't give up. He still coming forward towards Indra. He was still ready, well, telling Indra to fight. And then Indra cut another arm off and he's still there and he's still talking. He's still, and his talking was very controlled and equipoised. He wasn't like lamenting, oh, you've cut my arm off, oh, you've cut my other arm. You know, he, was, he wasn't at all attached to the material body. Even though his body was being cut off to pieces, he wasn't lamenting about it. He was going forward. Just like we saw Srila Prabhupada, in his final days, he was also in a lot of difficulty because he had not eaten for a long time. So his body had become skin and bones. But people were giving him massage and Prabhupada was, he didn't complain, he didn't mind. He didn't mind people coming and giving him little massage, even though it must, must have been quite painful for him. But he, he didn't mind because he was detached from his physical condition. So that's one side, one side of a, a liberated soul. But not only was he detached from the physical body, but as Madhiji said just now, he desired to go back to Godhead. He desired to get the association of the Lord. And he was speaking about the dust of the devotees. He, he, he was respecting the devotees, he, like Narada Muni. And he wanted to go to get service, to, to give service to Lord Sankarshan. So these two people were mentioned, Narada Muni and Lord Sankarshan. And this was the thinking of Vritasura. <coughs> So he was displaying his transcendental nature and detachment from the, everything material and complete absorption in the thought of service to the Supreme Lord. Right. He, was, he was telling Indra that you can kill me now. And he was ready because he had fixed his mind on the Lord. He had controlled his mind. He was remembering the Lord and he was preparing to go there. So that's, that's really pure devotion. At that point, when, when you're at that point of death, that, you, that one is so attached to the Lord that you just want to think of the Lord and you have no other interest, no other thought of the material world. We see ordinary people, they're always attached to the family and they're worried about their business, they're thinking about their money and their property and the children and so many things. But Vritasura, of course, Vritasura, he, he was a special person. He was born from the Yajna, specially to be the enemy of Indra. So, although he's the enemy of Indra, he still has devotion. Because we know from Bhagavad Gita, devotion is not lost. Even one may be an offender, devotion is never lost. It may be suspended for some time, but it's never lost. All right? Bhagavad Gita says, Neha Vikramana Shosti Pradyavayo Navijati. In this endeavor, there is no loss or diminution, and a little advancement made saves us from the greatest danger. 
So because of Vridasura's mood of devotion, he showed to Indra that he was really a pure devotee. So Maharaj Parikshit is very impressed. Maharaj Parikshit, of course, he doesn't know about Vritasura's previous life. And he wants to understand where did he get devotion from. So he's asking his spiritual teacher, Sukadeva Goswami, to kindly tell him where did he get this devotion. And so Prabhupada gives a lot of, gives quite a few quotes in the purport. I'll just read one from purport of text number five. It says, There are 90 million demigods and 70 million sages who are all called Narayan Aina, devotees of Lord Narayan. Among them, only a few are called Narayana Parayana. Narayana Parayana, there are very few. This is Vritasura. He was called Narayana Parayana. And they're very rare souls. Then Prabhupada continues, the difference between the Siddhas and the Narayana Parayana is that Direct devotees are called Narayana Parayana, whereas those who perform various types of mystic yoga are called Siddhas. So Vritasura, he's the direct devotee. He, he's, not, he's not doing any Siddhas, and he's not worried about that. And also in that same purport, Prabhupada explains, unless the dirt within the core of one's heart is cleansed away, one cannot become a pure devotee. Therefore, the word sudurlabha, very rarely found, are used in this verse. Not only among hundreds and thousands, but among millions of perfectly liberated souls, a pure devotee is hardly ever found. Therefore, the words kotishvapi are used herein. So, we can understand just how rare, how very special this Vritasura is. That, wow, he is really a great soul. So, Maharaj Pariksha wants to understand where did he get this devotion from? Just like in fifth canto, you have the same thing. You have Rahugana. He wants to understand where Jad Bharat got his devotion from. And Jad Bharat, he said the same thing. You have to get the dust from the feet of the devotees. So that's the important point. Text 6 says, Vridasura was situated in the blazing fire of battle and was an infinite, infamous sinful demon always engaged in giving trouble and anxieties to others. How could such a demon become so greatly Krishna conscious? Hmm. So he's really a very special soul and he's got Maharaj Parikshit really puzzled because here's Maharaj Parikshit preparing for death and he wants to develop his own devotion and he heard about this Vritasura, that he's a, a demon and he's got so much devotion. How could he get it? Where did he get it? So, that's uh, the topic which is going, we're going to hear. So, Sukadeva Goswami begins to explain. Uh, oh no, not Sukadeva, Sutta Goswami. Huh? Sutta Goswami. After hearing Maharaj Pariksha's very intelligent question, Sukadeva Goswami, most powerful sage, began answering his disciple with great affection. Oh, so Sutta Goswami just, 
he's telling about Sukadeva Goswami Maharaj Parikshit. Hmm? So, Sukadeva Goswami says, I will tell you what I heard from the mouths of Vyasadeva, Narada and Devala. So Narada, Vyasa and Devala. All three great sages have spoken this knowledge to Sukadeva Goswami. We're going to hear what they told him. And this is the pastime of Chitraketu. So then we're he we hear about Maharaj Chitraketu, that he was the king of a kingdom called Surasena, the province of Surasena. And he ruled the entire earth. During his reign, the earth produced all the necessities for life. So, Maharaj Surasena, or rather Maharaj Chitraketu is ruling, the, he's the king of Surasena, we can understand he must have been quite a good king. Why? Because the earth is providing. If the king is good, then when there's a good ruler, a good leader, then the earth provides. Then you get all the resources. If the leader is good, the head is good, then the earth is happy to provide. And if the leader, if the king is no good, then there will be problems, there will be difficulties. So there's a section here about uh, Maharaj Chitraketu understanding about his rule, how he was ruling the kingdom. Prabhupada quotes Ishopanishad, everything belongs to the Lord. So we need anything, the Lord can supply it. He's providing for everybody. He can certainly provide for his devotees. Prabhupada said, elephant needs to eat so many kilos every day, it's all provided. The little insects like the ants, they have to get their grains of sugar every day. They also get it. How do they all get it? Who provides? By the grace of God. He provides for everyone. Nityo nityanam chetanas chetananam eko bahunam yovidati kamam. That one Supreme Lord is providing the needs for everyone. So the necessities come from the earth. The earth is providing. The earth is a personality and we have to please the earth. When the earth is happy, then she's happy to provide everything. Everything in the form of so many different jewels and minerals, so many, not only just vegetables and fruits and grains, but cloth as well and minerals and, and gems and Everything is provided by the grace of the earth planet when the earth is properly taken care of. But Prabhupada mentions at the end of the purport text 10, simply ruling the land cannot solve man's problems unless the leader has spiritual capabilities. He must be like Maharaj Yudhisthira Parikshit Maharaj or Ramachandra, then all the inhabitants of the land will be extremely happy. So are people happy today? Is everybody happy? No Maharaj. Why not? What's the problem? Because yeah, because uh, uh, they are slaughtering so many animals, especially cows, so they are not happy. They are always in anxiety. Oh, because we are killing the cows. Yeah, Maharaj. 
So do you think we can convince people to stop killing cows? Yeah, it's difficult, but uh, we have to try for it. Hmm? Yes, you're right. We, ha we have a duty to protect the, the cow. It's the most important animal because she's the mother. So before Prabhupada left the world, he was very concerned about the cows. He spoke about America. He said, you know, America was very good to me. They let me come there and we established Krishna consciousness there. He said, I'm very grateful to the American people that they allowed our Krishna consciousness to develop there. But he said only one thing, he said, if only they wouldn't kill the cows. He spoke like that. He said, if only they didn't kill the cows, because Prabhupada saw how in America they do kill a lot of cows. Everywhere they have these beef farms and they keep the cows for beef. They're just for killing. So they're very cruel to the cows. So that's one reason people are not happy. Sorry Maharaj, I feel why we are not happy in this uh, time is we are not God-centric, we are becoming self-centric and we are on behind the material comforts then the thinking about the Lord. That also is causing us unhappiness. Too much absorption in the material things. Is it? What, what do you think that, that people's absorption and sense gratification? In compared to the olden days, they were very dharmic. Everything they are offering to Lord, they made Lord in center of their life. But now we kept ourselves centered in our, our life. That is causing us problem. We are unhappy. No. We've forgotten God. We're only interested in our own self. The body, body consciousness. Yes, okay. Yeah, we have many difficult to make people happy. It's a difficult job. The leaders, you know, politicians, they will always try to promise the people many things to get them, to support them. We see in democracy like that, how it went before the election, the politicians will come and they will speak many things, what we're going to do for you. And they try, they want to get the people, and they, they want to make the people happy. Of course, in Kali Yuga, to make people happy is, what, what did they, they simply want money. People that only think, they give me money, I will be happy. But because the people are all sudras, you give them money, they don't know how to use the money. They'll simply use it for sense gratification. They'll use it to eat meat, to take drugs, to take intoxication, to do sinful life. Actually, to give people money, is just to allow them to go faster to hell, into the hellish life. It's a very difficult job to be a leader. You can understand how much trouble these rulers must go to, to rule a kingdom. So here we have this king, Chitraketu, is ruling the earth. But fortunately, his kingdom, no problems. Of course, he has his own problem, but the general, general mood is that people are quite happy. So Chitraketu, it's described about his specific situation, that although the kingdom was very opulent, very nice, everything was good, it mentions here in the purport, pious king rules the earth according to Shastric injunctions, naturally there will be regular rainfall and sufficient produce to produce 
to provide for all men. There will be no question of exploitation, for everyone will have enough. Black marketeering and other corrupt dealings will then automatically stop. Yeah, when there's enough, then you don't have to have, we don't, there's no problem because people have enough, They're, they actually have it. Of course, we know it's rare that people will say they have enough. No matter how much you give them, they always want more. And they, there, there is, often you get corruption because people have so much greed. So this is a problem. Anyway, Maharaj Chitraketu is being described. He had 10 million wives, but although he was capable of producing children, he did not receive a child from any of the 10 million wives. By chance, all the wives were barren. It's very, <laughs> very difficult to hear this here. 10 million women and they're all barren. Could you imagine? What a situation. So, Maharaj Chitraketu is naturally very unhappy about this. But he has everything else. It mentions text 12 describes, he was endowed with a beautiful form magnanimity and youth, he was born in a high family, he had a complete education, he was wealthy, opulent. In spite of being endowed with all these assets, he was full of anxiety because he did not have a son. Just imagine, you see people are, many times people are like that, they have everything but one thing. And they want that one thing more. They, they're not satisfied. They couldn't be, couldn't be happy with what he's got. He wants something more. Of course, for a king to have no son, then it's very bad, big problem. He's worried. Who is going to deliver him? Who is going to do the pinda if he doesn't have a son? This is a problem. So, Maharaj, Maharaj Chitraketu is in a lot of anxiety. He the, said, Prabhupada said, the king was certainly most unhappy that he could not get a son. And this is why he had married so many times. So, we, we've seen some other pastimes like this in Srimad Bhagavatam. Of course, there was, a, there was a, a great king who had a son, right? Do you know that, the name, who was the name of that king who had, he had a son, but the son was no good? Who was the father king of, Anga. huh? King Anga, king Anga was Vena. He was the, the father of Maharaj Vena, cruel Vena. Right? The father of Vena. And then the Brahmanas, the son was so bad, the father went to the forest to get away from the son. For a long time the father didn't have a son. Then finally he got a son, but the son was so bad, he was so cruel, the father understood that this is the arrangement of God. He wants me to renounce the world and go to the forest. So he went off to the forest and left. Then the brahmanas cursed Vena, and from the body they brought out Prithu Maharaj. Right? So, here you have Chitraketu, all the queens are very beautiful, but they're all barren, no children. Hundreds and thousands of queens, the lands of which he was the proprietor, were sources of happiness. So, we hear, once upon a time, powerful sage Angira comes to meet Maharaj Chitraketu. So, we have Maharaj, 
Chitraketu receiving Angira. He has a nice reception for him, provides everything for his comfort, a nice seating arrangement. Maharaj Chitraketu is very humble. He, he gives a throne to Angira and Chitraketu sits at his feet. So Angira is very impressed that, whoa, this king is very nice, he's very humble, he's given me a nice reception and now he's sitting at my feet. And so Angira wants to ask him, how are you, my dear king? Just like you come to meet someone, you will ask them, how are you? You want to know, first of all, you may ask about, how, how is the kingdom? How is everything in the kingdom? We want to understand the situation. Of course, Angira is a great sage, he understands everything, he knows what's going on and he knows this king has got some problem. Anyway, first of all, we have Angira talking to Maharaj Chitra Ketu and if you look at text number 17 there, it's mentioned how he said, Angira says, My dear King, I hope that your body and mind and your royal associates and paraphernalia are well. When the seven properties of material nature are in proper order, the living entity within the material elements is happy. So the seven elements of material nature are mentioned, the total material energy, the ego and the five objects of sense gratification. So Srimad Bhagavatam is saying when these, when these elements are in proper order, then People are happy. People will be happy. The objects of sense gratification, the ego, the material energy. If they're all proper in proper order, people will be happy. And if the people are happy, then the king will also be happy. People are not happy, the king's also worried. It will affect the king. Because the king is the ruler, the leader. Just like we have leaders, so they have so many programs here in ISKCON nowadays, training leaders, they have our GBC college, they have all these different courses to train leaders because the leader has to be able to take care of the people under him, he has to lead them, not that he has to manage them. Managing is different. Leader is better than manager. We like to be led, we like to be inspired by a leader. So a king is like a leader. The king will have so many other people managing on his behalf, but the king is the actual leader of the society. So the verse says, without these seven elements one cannot exist. Similarly, a king is always protected by seven elements. The king is protected by seven elements. These seven elements are, first of all, his instructor, meaning his guru, his ministers, his kingdom, his fort, his treasury, his royal order, and his friends. So, the king needs to protect himself, he needs to have these things, he, he needs to have loyal ministers. And we, not, we heard also about Indra, how Indra when he disrespected his guru, he got big problems. He had to get out of heaven practically, he lost the heavenly planets, the, dem the demons conquered the demigods because Indra lost the favour of his guru. So just the guru is so powerful. And then the minister, sometimes we hear about the mini one minister kills the, the king, or 
comes and kills the king. If the ministers are envious, if they're not loyal, then it will create turmoil within the kingdom. Then his fort, the treasury, he has to have some money, he has to have some wealth. Otherwise, how can he look after this kingdom? He will have to make, there will be expenses. He has to have some treasury. He has to have some friends also. That's another important point. The king shouldn't be alone. He has to have some friends who he can relate to. Friendship. You know, there we see different rulers, different leaders. They will like to make friends, keep company. It's important to have friends who will support you and who will who you can discuss your situation and your problems with. Very important for uh, everyone. If you don't have any friends, then you can be you could be lonely. You, you listen to your own mind. There's nobody to consult with, nobody to guide you. So it's important to have friends, to have guru, to have ministers, these different people are very important if somebody is in the position to be a king or a leader. Prabhupada's purport, Prabhupada said, generally when the associates of the king are quiet and obedient, the king can be happy. <laughs> Therefore the great sage Angira Rishi inquired about the king's personal health and good fortune of his seven associates. When we inquire from a friend whether, whether everything is well, we are concerned not only with his personal self, but also with his family, his source of income, and his assistants or servants. All of them must be well, and then a person can be happy. So, looking at being a king doesn't mean just keep the king happy. But everybody in relation with the king, they also have to be happy. This is an important. And then the, the, the chapter goes on to describe more about the relationship between the king and his associates. That sometimes the associates will give instructions to the king. It's not always that the king decides everything himself and just does whatever he wants. Just like one may be a leader, it doesn't give him the right to just do everything, to decide everything himself. He has to listen to other people as well and hear what other people have to say. And Prabhupada did that. Although Prabhupada was the founder of Acharya, we see Prabhupada's, uh, in Prabhupada's life, he would often ask people, what do you think? And when the devotees began book distribution, Prabhupada wanted to know, he said, what do people say when you show, when you show them the books, when you show them my book, what do people say? One time, one life member came and he met Prabhupada and he was talking with Prabhupada. And Prabhupada was... Uh, just sharing with him, they were discussing, and the man said, yeah, I get the back to Godhead. And then the man said to Prabhupada, he said, you know Swamiji, he said, it will be very good if you put Srimad Bhagavatam inside the back to Godhead. And when Prabhupada heard this, he thought, yes, he thought, yeah, this is a very nice idea. And he, he told his secretary, he said, immediately, write a letter to Los Angeles where the BBT office is and tell them every month when they print Back to Godhead, they must print a supplement of Srimad Bhagavatam there inside the Back to Godhead magazine. So Prabhupada took the advice from a life member. It wasn't Prabhupada's idea, but Prabhupada heard from the life member and he agreed. He thought, this is a good idea, we should do this. 
Just like Prabhupada sometimes, he would get some health problem. One time the doctor told Prabhupada, he said, you should go for a walk every morning, Swamiji. So Prabhupada began to go for a walk every morning. He would go and he'd walk for one hour every morning because the doctor told him, he said, this will be very good for your health. So Prabhupada wasn't above listening to other people. He would ask devotees, what do you think? What do you think? What should we do? So just being a leader doesn't mean that you decide everything yourself. Some things you will decide, other things you have to hear from others. Sometimes you have to do what other people say. You cannot just do what you want. You can't think, because I'm the leader, I will decide everything. So this is mentioned here. The purport of text number 18, a king should not simply give orders to his dependents because he is supreme. Sometimes he must follow their instructions. Similarly, the dependents should depend on the king. This mutual dependence will make everyone happy. Mutual dependence, right? The king and his subjects, the king and his ministers, the king and his officers, he's ready to hear from them. So we try to apply like that within ISKCON also. Often we have meetings and we have Istagosti. Prabhupada would call the meetings Istagosti, Istagosti, coming together and discussing topics of Krishna and thinking how we can expand the Krishna consciousness movement. What do we need to do? What is our, what is our assets and what are our problems? What are the threats? What can we do to in improve? like this. Any questions so far? So the purport of text 19 says, the king, the master or king and his subordinates should be interdependent. Through cooperation, both of them can be happy. It's important, that mood of working together, working together. Just like in our ISKCON society, we have the GBC body, and the GBC body, they hear from other people. They have Every now, we, we were having regularly uh, Sangha with the temple leaders and gurus and there's another, a new arrangement now, we have uh, Sabha, Sabha with the leaders from different sections of the ISKCON society who are not involved so much directly in management but who are very senior and mature in Krishna consciousness and they're giving advice, they're giving also, uh, they're expressing different opinions towards the GBC. So in ISKCON we're trying to facilitate the same kind of mood, interdependence, that it's not that the, the managers can just rule without consulting with the devotees, with the ordinary rank-and-file devotees, that we all work together. And this is shown here, this is brought out here in this section of the Srimad Bhagavatam. What is good rule? So Angira is asking like this, he's asking the king, he was asking about, first of all, about the kingdom, and then he asks him 
he asks him in text 19, he asks him about his wives and his citizens and servants and merchants. <laughs> he said, even those who sell spices and oil under your control, Are you also in full control of ministers, the inhabitants of your palace, your provincial governors, your sons and your other dependents? Are they all under your control? <laughs> and then text 20, we get the most important point about good management, good government. Angira asks the king whether his mind is under full control. And Prabhupada said, this is most essential for happiness. You want, we want to be happy. If, the, if we're not happy, then, then it's a problem. Then something is wrong. We come to Krishna consciousness, or wherever we are, whatever we're doing, we should feel pleasure, we should feel some happiness in it. It shouldn't be miserable. So it's very important that people have to learn to control their minds. The mind should be satisfied, peaceful. Of course, that is what we would call the mode of goodness. Brahmanas, they should be peaceful in their minds, satisfied, controlled. If the mind is not peaceful, then people cannot be happy. So this is important in good government. The leader, his mind has to be controlled. And he has to be, when he's happy, he's peaceful, we want to see that the people who are working with him, that they are also peaceful, their minds are also controlled. It's very important. So, Angira, he looks at Maharaj Chitraketu and he can understand. He said, I see something is on your mind. You don't look very peaceful. There's a saying that the face is the index of the mind. So Maharaj Chitraketu, his mind, his mind is not peaceful and it shows in his face. And Angira can see it. He sees within the face of Chitraketu. And of course, Angira is a great soul. He knows the situation. But he can see also in his face that you're not peaceful. He says, your pale face reflects your deep anxiety. <laughs> so, is it because of your, yourself or has it been caused by others? What is the cause of the anxiety? So Angira knows, but he wants Maharaj Chitraketu to reveal it to him. So Maharaj Chitraketu, he becomes very humble and he bows deeply and then he expre explains to Angira Muni that problem is, of course, that I have so many wives, but I don't have any son. Of course, Maharaj Chitra Ketu doesn't immediately express that. First of all, he glorifies Angira, tells him, you're a great yogi, you know everything, you can control everything, you control your mind and senses, you know everything, you're just asking me. So, because you've asked me, it's my duty to tell you. And Maharaj Chitraketu gives a nice example. Text number 25, he said, just like a person may be suffering from hunger and thirst, 
And if you give him a flower garland and sandalwood pulp on his head, it's not going to, be, it's not going to help him. The person's hungry and thirsty, and you give him a flower garland and sandalwood pulp on his head, you know, it's, <laughs> it's just out of place, right? You know, you, can you imagine you're hungry and thirsty and they come and put a big flower garland around your neck and give you sandalwood pulp on your forehead? Oh, very nice, but look, I'm hungry, I'm starving, I want to eat. So Chitraketu says like that, he said, in the same way, although my kingdom's so opulent, although I have so much, I have so much property, I have so many possessions, he said, but I have no son. So this is a problem. And without a son, then who is going to deliver me? Because the son is called the putra. And the putra means one who saves the father from going to hell. The, the son has to offer the ablations to deliver the father, not only the father, but the, all the forefathers in that line, they're all delivered by the offerings of the son. So, Maharaj Chitra Ketu reveals his situation. He says, kindly do something so that I may have a son to deliver us from hellish condition. Maharaj Chitra Ketu is worried that if there's no son to make the offerings, I have to go to hell. And all, my, all the forefathers also will be in hell. Nobody will deliver us. It's very important to have this son. Of, what about a Krishna conscious devotee? Do we have to worry about this? No matter. Why not? Because the Lord will take care of us. Because what? The Lord will take care of us. Oh, Krishna will take care of you. Why? Because we are, we always serve the Lord. So he takes care of the devotees. So we don't have to worry about anything else. Yeah, this is for the Vedic tradition. On the material platform, these things have to be done. But if one is not on the material platform, if one is actually transcendentally situated, then we simply have to engage in devotional service. The oblations offered to the ancestors. And we can deliver them all by devotional service. They'll get much more benefit if we do devotional service than if we just offer oblations. So it's much more important for us to do devotional service. So Maharaj Chitra Ketu is heard from, he's given some special sweet rice by Angira. Ang Angira arranges to do a yagya and he gets some sweet rice and then he, he gives it to Chitra Ketu's wife. He gives it to his first wife. Her name was Krita Duty. Krita Duty. And she's described as being the most perfect among Chitraketu's millions, millions of queens. So he, he gives the he gives the remnants from the yagna, yagna to her. And then she conceives a child. Angira tells him that 
you will have a son, but this son will be cause of both jubilation and lamentation, right? Harsha and, and shoka. Harsha, jubilation and shoka, lamentation. So Maharaj Shikitu is thinking, oh, very good, I have a son. And Angira told him, it will be the cause of lamentation. But, and then after that, then he just left. He didn't explain any more. And Chitraketu was thinking, well, no problem. The son may, may not be very obedient, right? Chitraketu thought maybe the son will just be disobedient. In what way will he be the cause of lamentation? Chitraketu thought, Maharaj Chitraketu thought, what could happen? Yes? Yes? He thought uh, the son may not obey him. He will be a disobedient son, so that he will be a source of uh, distress for Chitraketu. Yes, bringing up children is not easy. Naturally, children not always obedient. It can be a great test of patience sometimes when you bring up children. So, Maharaj Chitraketu, anyway, he's happy, he just wants a son. He's not really thinking what the son's going to be like or anything. He's just concerned, just give me the son, I just want the son. So, he goes along with the, the whole plan that he's got the, he's got the sweet rice, he, he gives it to the wife, she conceives, and they're going to have a son. And Prabhupada explains, the whole world is so polluted, Prabhupada says, material world is so polluted that people want to have a son even though the son may be useless. This attitude is represented in the history of King Chitraketu, one of our, one of our devoted ladies in Russia. She told me how her son died recently. He'd been a drug addict for years. You know, so quite a common thing these days. You get children, young people, they get into drugs and they can never get out of the drugs. They get into drugs, they become addicted to the drugs, they can never get out of them and they end up dying. So it's such a waste that the, the mother and father, the parents, they want so much to have a son, to have a child, and they get the child, and then the child grows up like that, they get, get into drugs, and then they die early, life wasted. It's so discouraging, it's so a waste of life. This is common. useless anyway Chitraketu's wife has become pregnant after eating the food and then gradually she develops her pregnancy and Maharaj Chitraketu is very happy his wife has conceived the child and then in course of time the boy is born and when the child is born then Chitraketu is really ecstatic. He's so happy that he's got the child that he wanted 
And the example is given just like a man who is very poor. So when he gets money, he's so happy after great, after great austerity, somehow for after being poor and struggling for a long time, after a long time he gets money, he gets a lot of money, he's very happy, he feels so jubilant. So Maharaj Chitraketu is like that. He got a son, he wanted a son so badly. Finally he got this son, even though the boy is just born, but just a baby. The king is so ecstatic, my child, he feels so, so, so happy in himself that he's got this child and he gives so much charity. He gives away a lot of gold in charity, he gives ornaments, he gives villages, he gave horses, he gave elephants, he gave 60 crores of cows. That's 600 million cows. My goodness, that's a lot of cows. He gave them all in charity. How many cows he must have had? So this is really an, an amazing king, 10 million wives and 600 million cows given in charity. So Maharaj Chitraki, it gives an, an idea, we can understand how jubilant he is, how happy he is to have the son. It means so much to him. We see people, sometimes they, they want very much to do something, maybe they have some material desire and when they get it, they're so happy. Did you have any experience like that ever? You wanted something in the material world, maybe you wanted to get a job or you wanted to marry someone or you wanted to pass an exam or something like that, some kind of material plan you wanted and when you pass it, when you get it, you feel so happy. Of course, we could never expect to compare to Maharaj Chitra Ketu and his happiness. Example is given just like a cloud indiscriminately pours water on the earth. The benedictions King Chitraketu to increase the reputation, opulence and longevity of his son, distributed the, the, distributed the rainfall distributed like rainfall all desirable things to everyone. Oh, okay. So this is the way of material world. You get something, you feel so happy, but along with the happiness there's the other side. There's, it's like two sides of a coin. On one side the head, the other side the tail. So you get happiness, but along with the happiness, there's the other side, it's coming. We're going to hear about the distress which comes. So devotee is very careful not to get too much attached, not to make too many plans for trying to enjoy the material world. Because we should understand that with that happiness, there's always going to come distress. So a devotee is always very cautious. So what happens then? Maharaj Chitraketu is very happy. He got the son. So his wife who delivered the child, she must also feel very proud. What about the other queens? How are they going to take it? We will ask the class, somebody can tell us, 
how are the other queens going to respond with this? Hare Krishna Maharaj, they are, they are jealous of the queen who has the dog son and they feel they are neglected also. Oh, who is neglecting them? King. Maharaj Chitraketu. Is ne neglecting them. And they're envious. So what should be a what should have happened in that kind of situation? I think it would have been better if uh, Chitraketu would have made some solution with Angira. Not only just to have a son, but also to pacify the other wives, so that there wouldn't be a danger. But uh, being overwhelmed with the prosperity that he would get one son with his best of the wives, I think he was blinded by that happiness. And so he forgot all of that. And thereby he created a very big uh, trouble for himself. And that's reflected in uh, all the other queens literally poisoning the child. Mm. So he should have been much more introspective. He should have planned this whole thing much more carefully. Yes, Maharaj. Yes. Certainly a very dangerous situation. Keeping so many wives. You, 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 we also wonder, how, how could he manage to give attention to so many wives? That must have been a challenge also, even without the sun. Anyway, this is the pastime as it's told here. So Chitraketu, after great difficulty, receives the sun. His affection for the sun increased day by day. And the other wives, they're so jealous. They're described, they're, they were, uh, they're described as being hard-hearted. Of course, we're told here also how they condemn themselves. that the king's negligence towards them, they condemned themselves in envy and lamented. So, they could understand there was some problem on their part that they were not able to have the child that they, were, they lament their position, and they say their, their position is if described as being even less than the maidservants. Would you like to explain this, how they could be less than the maidservants when they were the wives? And it also mentions here, it says, condemned in every respect because of her sinful life. Such a woman is condemned in every respect because of her sinful life. What is this? It actually means that uh, when a when, uh, woman is married, she should bear a child. Being barren is actually because of her sinful past life. 
this, it can be considered like that, like a karmic reaction. Yes, Maharaj. Of course, some people may take it, we can also take this to be a blessing. That you don't have a chance. When they turn to Krishna consciousness, then it's a blessing. Otherwise, it's going to be really a very uh, lamentable situation. Okay. But, of course, sinful activities can be done, undone by devotional service. When people come to Krishna consciousness, then the, the parabdha karma can also be removed. Right? So even the barren women, they can become fertile women by doing devotional service. Is it possible? Yes, Maharaj, in one sense, like uh, uh, when, the, when the devotee is actually prays to the Lord, especially for a son, as we see in case of uh, be it Kardamamuni or be it uh, uh, like uh, Devahuti or even Aditi, the Lord actually responded. It's not that they were barren, but they had desired for the child. So similarly, once one who comes to the devotional service and uh, renders the service, then they can also have a good chance to become fertile. Yes, karma is not eternal. And we... We quote from Brahma Samhita, Yas Vendra Gopa Mata Vendra Mahoso Karma. The devotional service burns up to the roots all fruit of activities of those who are engaged with devotion. So, karma. Uh, the, 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 the roots of all of our karma can be destroyed by devotional service. Sometimes we say, Mukam karoti vachalam pangam langaiti green. The, the dumb man can recite poetry, blind man can see the stars by the mercy of Panchatattva, by mercy of the spiritual teacher, it's possible. Sometimes it happens. Anyway, here in this particular case, the child is born and Maharaj Chitraketu is overwhelmed with pleasure, he's so happy and he gives so much love and attention to the child and also to the child's mother. And the other ladies are envious and they feel neglected, they feel left out. And they said, where they consider themselves to be most unfortunate. Or as we heard, even less than the maidservants. Because at least the maidservants, they're taking care of the king, is appreciating them but he's just completely neglected the other wives, that they're barren, they're no use. So he doesn't worry about them. And so, text 40, 40, uh, 43 describes, as their envy increased, they lost their intelligence, being extremely hard-hearted, and unable to tolerate the king's neglect, they finally administered poison to the son. So, note, their envy increased. Envy. And the all-devouring sinful, this envy, this is... Uh, oh, the previous verse describes also 
the co-wives always burned in envy, which became extremely strong. So this quality of envy is such a dangerous thing. We have to be very careful to guard against this envy. And Krishna, of course, appreciates Arjuna because Arjuna is without envy. Because you're not envious, Arjuna. So I'm speaking this knowledge of Bhagavad Gita to you. And Srimad Bhagavatam also describes it's for those without envy, for the non envious. The envy has to be destroyed. We have to be very conscious. Not how can we give up envy? How can we conquer over envy? Any suggestions? Thank you so much. Yes, Prabhu. Just by realizing that I'm not this body. Okay. Understanding we're not the body. Because envy is based often on the body, right? Yes, ma'am. But envy, what are we envious of? We're envious of someone's what? Usually we're envious of someone's got something I don't have. Maybe they've got power, maybe they've got money, they've got some position, some opulence. So we may envy them. So we should simply understand, what do you say Paramananda? Yes Maharaj, even Lord Krishna says, Name Dvaishasi, Name Priya. So I was hearing, he said, there is no one uh, greater to him, so that's why he is not envy with anybody. If we are envy with somebody, because someone is greater than me. Mm. So what should we think? I'm not the body. <laughs> yeah. It's difficult. Yes, Prabhu? Yeah, Guru Maharaj, I, uh, it's also said that uh, envy starts from envying Krishna first. So if we can cultivate Krishna consciousness, then automatically envy will come to an end. Okay, yes. The person we envy more than anybody else is Krishna, because Krishna's got everything more than us, much more. And so we envy Krishna. So if we can become Krishna conscious, if we begin develop love for Krishna, or devotion for Krishna, then we could give up envy. Yes? Anything else? Uh, we should find good qualities in that person and praise him. Okay. Try to appreciate the good qualities in others. Maharaj? Yes? Uh, um, uh, uh, we'll become proud when we, you know, uh, when we think that we, like, if we have uh, more money or more, uh, uh, more, more than what we, uh, what we deserve. Um, but when we uh, do not get much what we want, then that envy will start. So that uh, we should not be, uh, you know, um, uh, like uh, think about getting more than what we want. So we should be self-sufficient, self-satisfied. So and then, you know, uh, just uh, uh, be in Krishna consciousness and then, you know, uh, accept what uh, what is happening in our daily life and accept what the things and uh, consider it is all the the plan by Krishna only, so and then move on, so that envious can be, uh, it can, you know, uh, it can be eliminated. All right. So by understanding that what's happening to us is Krishna's arrangement, we're not the controllers, we're simply instruments and we're under Krishna's control. Krishna knows what's good for us and Krishna's put us in this situation. We should accept it, control the mind. But 
If we simply contemplate another person's situation and we envy them, then out, like here in this situation, these ladies, they lost their intelligence. Right? In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna also speaks about that. Right? Jayato by contemplating the objects of the senses, a person becomes attached to them. Then from such attachment, lust develops. Then from lust comes what? What comes from lust? Anger. Anger. A anger. And then after anger? Delusion. And then after delusion? Surti Vibrama. Uh, Bewilderment of memory. Bewilderment of memory. And Bewilderment of memory. And then? Uddinasya. Fall down. Yeah, and intelligence then in, 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 intelligence is lost. Intelligence is lost. It, it speaks about losing your intelligence. And then he falls into the material pool. So we lose the intelligence. It comes to like that. We, we become attached. We're, we're looking at things and we're thinking about, I want this, I want to enjoy that. This contemplation of the sense objects. And then because we don't have everything we want, we become envious of others and we lose the intelligence. So it's a very dangerous situation. And then what happened? They, they lost their intelligence, they're hard-hearted, they didn't appreciate that, oh, somehow she had the baby and we didn't have it. And, and then they made the plan to poison the, the little child. So, so very dangerous situation, we must always guard against the mind, control the mind. Anyway, the, the child was given poison, the little child was given poison, unaware. The mother is walking around the house thinking that her son was sleeping. She did not understand that he was dead. Wow. So, this is the situation. So, the wife is asking, Bring my son, where is my son? I haven't seen my son for some time. She calls the nurse and the nurse, the nurse goes to see the child and she sees the child that his eyes are turned upward. No sign of life. Everything stopped. And then the servant falls to the ground. She could understand the child had left the body and she says, she falls to the ground and said, now I am doomed. So seeing the maidservant fall to the ground, then the mother wonders what has happened. And she sees the maidservant, she's striking her body with her own hands. And the queen came and when she came and, she, and then when she came and saw the son was dead, then, then she also became like the servant. And she also fell to the ground and she's crying and beating her body and completely, going completely berserk. Definitely very painful experience to lose something after getting the child which they wanted for so long and then to have the child die, very, very painful experience. So the loud crying, everybody in the palace knows about it. They all come, they're all worried what happened, what's going on. And the queens who had given poison they also cried. They were also crying. They knew what had happened. So they're also crying.
So Ch Chitraketu heard of the son's death, and he's, when he hears, then he, he also breaks down, becomes blind. It's a, a very painful thing, of course, losing people, family members, loved ones, people who are very dear to us. When we lose them, it's very difficult. It takes some time to get over it. So here Maharaj Chitraketu and his wife and everybody in the kingdom practically, they're all affected because it, it's very inauspicious for the kingdom that the young child dies. People all wonder, what happened? What's wrong? The king's son, how could he die? He's just born. Of course, these kind of experiences can be very powerful and they can help us a lot to become very serious about spiritual growth, about developing our spiritual position. Distress is one of the, uh, sometimes it leads us into serious devotion. So this distress of Maharaj Chitra Ketu can turn out to be a blessing for him. Not immediately though, he has a lot of lamentation to do in order, well, he doesn't have to lament, but he's going to lament, definitely. Sometimes we see people when they have a disaster in the family, it's better sometimes for them to lament at the time. Because if they don't, if they just keep the lamentation within them and they don't release it, then later on it may come out, it comes out later on and it may be there for a long time. So it's better that it comes out at the time rather than they keep it within them. That's one experience which we have. But I remember one time we had a couple, a devotee couple, and their child died. Actually what happened was the child that was in the Philippines actually, there was a devotee couple, they had a son, and somehow the son fell into the, a swimming pool. There was a swimming pool and the child somehow fell into the swimming pool and drowned. So the couple, the, the, the mother at, at least anyway, she kept the lamentation within her. She didn't release it. And she, she just like, oh, oh. You know, she, she was, of course, upset, but she didn't really break down. She didn't hardly show much emotion at all. But then, after some time, it became more apparent. It became more developed in her. The lamentation, the grief, the sorrow of lo losing her child, losing her son. The husband, he showed emotion at the time of the death of the child, but he got over it. But she never got over it. So sometimes it's, we see here Maharaj Chitraketu that he certainly was very emotional seeing the death of his child. He went on. But he he was able to get the mercy that Angira is going to come and deliver him and speak to him. So we hear the king is berserk, he's falling apart, 
and the queen is crying and all the citizens, all the family, everybody in the palace, they're all crying, they're all in great pain, they're feeling the sorrow, the loss of the child, so painful to them. And we hear about the lamentation of the, the queen. This is in text 54. And, and she accuses Providence that what kind of creator are you? That, right? What does she say? What, what does, how does uh, the queen address Providence? Someone would like to tell me in their own words? Uh, she said that uh, the, a, father, a son should not die in front of father. And if he's dying, that it seems that you are mercy, you are not having a mercy and people will not like, they will say that you are merciless. Yes. Because uh, Maharaj also, she said, they, she said that you are inexperienced in creation. You said, yeah, you're inexperienced in creation. Yes. And you've allowed the son to die before the father, right? Why? What's wrong with that? In the purport, the Prabhupada mentions that that's acting in the opposition to your creative laws. Yeah, creative laws, right? We would, we would expect the older person to go first. Somebody's old, why should a young person die? There's so many old people. Let the old people die first and then the young people should die. But sometimes we see the young people come first. A young person dies before the old people. It's not really the law. What did you say, Prabhu? How does Prabhupada call it? Prabhupada says that it is against your creative laws. Against creative laws. creative laws. Okay. That usually we would expect the old person or the father to die before the son. Certainly painful for the, the son to go first. Painful for the mother and father to lose their son. Okay, what else does she say? She says, you are the enemy of the living entities. <laughs> you are the enemy of the... Who, who is the enemy of the living entities? The providence, Maharaj. Providence is... Okay. <laughs> Why? Why is providence the enemy of the living entity? Uh, because it's not allowing uh, the King Chitraketu to be happy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's basically the, the providence is contradicting its own laws of uh, not allowing the young one to flourish in front of the older ones and snatched away the, old, the younger ones and so that's why it says that it's the enemy of the living entities and never merciful. Okay. And she also says that, if, what did she say, if somebody said, that, well, this is a karma, if we, we, somebody may say this is a karma of this child, then what does the queen say about that? There is no need for a controller in that case. Yes, right. There's no need of a controller. Karma itself is a controller, right? What is that philosophy? Karma Mimamsa. Yes, right. Karma Mimamsa. The karma itself is supreme. So what does she say about that? There's no need for a controller. And, and what else does she say? about that if it's everything is just karma if it's just karma then she 
She said, there's no need to be affectionate to the child. There's no point in being affectionate anymore. Because our affection was to take care. But if it's all karma, by karma he has to go, by karma the son has to die. There's no point to be affectionate and to have loving and take care of the child. Because it's all just karma. So like this, she's arguing, talking to Providence. Okay, so then uh, she, talk, she continues talking. She considers, she said, text 58, she said, I am certainly most unfortunate for I can no longer see your mild smiling. So that, like that, that intense attachment, feeling the, the loss of their child. I can no longer see your pleasing smile. I can no longer hear your, your pleasing voice. Even the crying of the baby was so much pleasure to the couple, but now it's all gone. So like this, lamenting, and so it's at this time Angira Muni is going to appear and he's going to come along with Narada and they will give wonderful instruction, much needed instruction. Just like when Srila Prabhupada left the world, after Prabhupada left the world, then many devotees all came, all gathered in Vrindavan. And every day we spend the whole morning and evening discussing and hearing topics, hearing transcendental wisdom to enlighten all of us, to help us to overcome the attachment which we were feeling in the loss of our spiritual teacher. So it's very important after the departure of a person that we hear spiritual knowledge and we should get proper authorized statements from scriptures, from qualified persons to present spiritual knowledge to guide us and to help us to control our mind in these difficult situations. So Angira is going to, Angira and Narada are going to enlighten Maharaj Chitraketu. Okay, are there any questions? Any comments? I'm sure you've all have departures, you've lost people in your families, maybe some friends or some loved ones, you had to deal with this. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. I have a question. Yes. Uh, in, the, in the very beginning of this chapter, where the uh, Prabhupada had quoted Yesha Vatvam Tagatam Papam Jananam Puri Karmanam, I think, he, once we have that, uh, all this, then only we become devotees, something. So how do we understand that? In a devotional service? Yes. How do we uh, Devotional service is not dependent on any, like we, we learned that we don't have, even the uh, person who's sinful can become devotee. Even who can become devotees? Even if he's a sinful person and if he gets the association of devotee, he becomes devotee. Yes. So uh, this shloka which Bhagavad Gita speaks that Yesham Tundgatam Papam Jananam Punyakaram. But we have to understand that people who come to Krishna consciousness, it doesn't mean they're immediately coming to the level of devotion, which is described there. You see that verse is describing, they said, Dridavrat engage themselves in my service with determination. 
So it's a very high quality of devotion. So to come to that level of devotion, that's, it's not going to be immediate. It's going to take some time. To get so is the, punya, is the punya karma what we do? It, like this punya karma is the regular punya karma or this punya karma is the hearing about the Lord that shav, punya shavana kirtanam? You mean the, pu the punya karma mentioned in the verse? Yeah. That punya karma in the verse, that is the, the devotion which you get from the devotee. Okay. You have to serve the devotee, just like when the devotee asks Prabhupada, did I become a devotee because of my pious activity? Prabhupada laughed at him. He said, I am creating your pious activity. You see, there's bhakti unmuli sukriti, right? Bhakti unmuli sukriti is sukriti which gives devotion. But there's other kinds of sukriti. You know, you can do a lot of sukriti which is on the material platform, nothing to do with devotion. It does, it's not going to get you bhakti. You get the, you get the, you need to get the bhakti unmuli sukriti. That is what brings us to Krishna Consciousness, when you do service for a devotee. And we serve Śrīla Prabhupāda, because Śrīla Prabhupāda is the, he lives through the Krishna Consciousness movement. So when you serve the ISKCON Society, the Krishna Consciousness movement, you're actually doing service for Śrīla Prabhupāda, and that qualifies you for bhakti. So we try to do that, we, we encourage devotees, you know, you do service, you, maybe you distribute books, or you donate for the temple, or you distribute prasadam or something. You do things like th these activities on behalf of Srila Prabhupada, and you get, you get the punya, you get the sukriti of a pure devotee. So it's not just any kind of goodness, any kind of punya, which gets you bhakti. You have to, it has to be in relation to a devotee, in relation to the pure devotee. That will get you bhakti. So Bhagavad Gita, yesham tvantagatam papam jananam punya karmana. Yeah, that punya karma, that has to come from the devotee. Otherwise it won't get you bhakti. Is it clear? Yes, Father. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for bringing it up. But that's an important point. Prabhupada said, I am creating your pious activities. The piety we want is the piety which will give us bhakti. So we get that from Prabhupada. And our contact with Prabhupada comes through his teachings, through his books, through his movement. Yes? Any other points? Anybody? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Prabhu. It is also, it is also worth noting that even though Chitra Ketu had the opportunity to meet Narada and Nagira, he did not actually ask for bhakti. So sometimes, due to opulence and due to lamentation, one may become blinded, even though there is an opportunity to seek for a real deliverance through bhakti, one may be overwhelmed with his own position and does not make use of the opportunity. Yes, that will, that will come out tomorrow. That will come up in the next class, the next chapter, it comes out like that. And Gira says like that. He said, I could have you know, I, I knew when I came here that you just wanted the child. You didn't want devotion. You didn't want to hear, really. But so people often, they don't know. Not everybody knows about bhakti or about devotion. They, not everybody's aware of the importance of that. And even if they hear about it, they're so absorbed. We're so absorbed in the material world. It's dif difficult for us to understand the importance of it. So, 
we know trying to give bhakti to people, it's not, not many people who really want it. They're not interested. When we try to tell them, we may be convinced about it, but, you know, it doesn't mean everybody else is going to take it very seriously. Hare Krishna Maharaj, small doubt Maharaj, what you are telling is correct, you didn't ask for bhakti, but as a kshatriya, as a, a good ruler, he can expect a, a head to protect his kingdom, isn't it Maharaj? As a good ruler, to protect his he, kingdom? He want, yeah, he wants a, a son who can take care of the kingdom after him. That is also not wrong as a Kshatriya is expecting a child, isn't it, Maharaj? Well, we don't hear that so much in the purport that he wants his son to take care of the kingdom, but certainly that is there. That certainly the king would want a son who is a successor who would take over and rule the kingdom, that the father will want to retire eventually and as he gets older he will want to give up the throne, give up the throne to his son and go off. So that is there, but the point which is made more in the purport is they're talking about offering the pinda, offering the oblations, you know, that they want to deliver the forefathers. But your point is certainly true that the, 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 the king really should have a son to continue the dynasty because if there's no king then it's a problem. They need, every kingdom should have a king, they have to have a leader, they have to have a ruler. Somebody has to take charge. And so this, this is a problem. That's why the king was in so much anxiety. You could imagine how much anxiety he must have been to, to have 10 million wives. Of course, in those days they didn't have things like what they have today, you know, the, when people want a child then, then they have a lot of other alternative means today. But they did have great sages and great yogis and the, these yogis, they could arrange everything. And Angira came and he did. He arranged, but the problem was the child was some happy, some lam, harsha and shoka was both happiness and lamentation. Yes, so having sons, having children is very nice, but for every, just like we say, you keep a cow. It's nice to have a cow, you get milk, but it's a lot of work also to take care of the cow. And so they say, if milk is available in the marketplace, why bother to keep the cow? But certainly kings, they're expected to have descendants to continue the dynasty, very important. The kings generally, that's why we would, they would have many wives and they, have, they would have many children. In the times of Maharaj, Prata Parudra, it was like that. And even up until recently, maybe a hundred years ago, you had like the king of Jaipur and his wives and so on. So not only India, all over the world that this is a system. There'd be rulers, there's kings and rulers and their kingdoms and they have their wives. But the principle is there that the, 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 the king is meant to be, is not meant to be independent, he's meant to be interdependent along with the city, that sometimes he will take instructions, he's not just giving orders. 
not just doing what he wants, is not absolute. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, among men I am the monarch. And so sometimes, you, of course, you get kings like that, they think, I am the, I'm the god. So that's a problem, if the king thinks he's god. But he should encourage the people in God consciousness. He should inspire the people in their spiritual lives. He should bring them to God by his own devotion, by his example. As Prabhupada said, there's, there's no benefit to have a king who is not a devotee. If he's not spiritually inclined, then he cannot do any good for his kingdom. So leader must be the example of devotion for his kingdom, for his for the followers. Without devotion for the Lord, then it's just simply so many zeros. So many zeros, no value, nothing. They may, be, they may have so much good knowledge, education, very powerful, very charismatic, but no devotion, useless. Okay, so we'll go on on Thursday night. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Jai. Go back to. Hare Krishna.